The first thing I'd like to do is just review real quickly the first three um, positions that I presented last week. Um, and then what I intend to do is we'll start off by building a Christian foundation. So we're going to go to Genesis to build that foundation. Um, and then we'll add a few elements um, from the law. And then I'm basically going to pass out the same format of answers to the questions that I did for the first three. My intent is to try to do that all within an hour and leave us at least half an hour for discussion. So that's the goal. Uh, I'd, I'd like to give us quite a lot of time to talk about it. So I'm gonna cover, try to cover a lot of ground real quick. Um, the first thing, just a caveat, most people around here, um, uh, th this will be an unusual sort of presentation. I'll kind of be jumping in just kind of jumping in in and particular verses here and there. That's not what we often do, um, but it's the only way I can cover what I want to cover about one topic here in a period of time. But I do just want to add the caveat that it's only as good as the work being actually done that I've understood what those verses mean in their context. So that's, of course, the caveat. If I misunderstood them, then um, I have a problem. And I'm not going to be able to go through all my justification for all of it tonight. So um, uh, so anyway, I'm just going to make that presentation. And then in the question and answer, you can correct me or whatever needs to be done about that. So anyway, that's the plan. So first, real quick, uh, I just want to review the three models from last time. Uh, the first one, Model A, the Enlightenment model. The ultimate good for mankind was material prosperity. The purpose of nature, provide man with his material needs. The immediate goal was profit. The mechanism for management, supply and demand. The model of dominion, absolute ruler. Man's responsibility is to maximize our economic efficiency. And then two questions. Does nature have intrinsic worth? And in this perspective, the answer is no. And is it necessary to protect all species? Uh, the answer is no. As I mentioned last time, usually people who present these three perspectives um, that's more or less what they present, uh, whether they write it in articles, books, or even when, if I'm interacting with them. Rarely, if ever, do they ever acknowledge the foundation that underlies their view. And what I would argue with these three views, um, I might be wrong, but I think a lot of people, maybe most people, haven't really thought about the foundation so much, but they just kind of gravitate towards one. Just an unarticulated, unarticulated move towards a foundation that's unarticulated. So the foundation of this ethical system is God does not exist. Man is an animal. There's only the here and now. That's all that matters. And all that exists is matter. So um, that's model A. So model B. Um, oh, the first model was uh, the model of the Enlightenment. Um, a very common view still had, held by a number of people today. The second model, model B, is I've labeled it radical environmentalism. The ultimate good here was spiritual. Our goal is to connect with God. The purpose of nature is to provide man's spiritual needs, and in this view, wilderness is sacred. The immediate goal for human beings is to minimize our material needs and to experience God mostly through wilderness. The mechanism for management um, is that the government would manage uh, especially the wilderness areas. The model of dominion is 
Uh, I call it worshiper. I haven't come up with another name for it yet. Uh, maybe somebody can help me with that, but it seems to cover the territory reasonably well. Man's responsibility here is to tread lightly and protect the environment, especially the wilderness. Does nature have intrinsic worth? Yes. Is it necessary to protect all species? Yes. The foundation of this view is that God exists and he exists within the creation. Um, this is a pantheistic view. In their view, man is a spiritual animal. Um, in fact, divinity is in each one of us. And in their view, man is morally responsible for the environment. So that's model B. Those are the two extreme positions. There's a sort of a middle position. I call this the environmentalist or the conservationist model. The ultimate good for mankind is material and spiritual needs. The purpose of nature is to meet our material and spiritual needs. So an immediate goal is for us to meet our material needs while protecting the environment. The mechanism here for management would be the government would manage in largely using the best science. To the best science is what's considered the goal for management. The model of dominion here is stewardship and it's man's responsibility to be a good steward. In this model, does nature have intrinsic worth? Yes. Is, is, is it necessary to protect all species? Some would say yes, some would say no in this model. Um, the foundation here, and the foundation of this view is mostly uh, comes from Darwin. God does not exist, only the material exists. Man is an animal, therefore only the here and now matters and man is morally responsible for the, uh, for the environment. So those are the three positions um, as I articulated them. And I pointed out last time that at the end that they have their superstructure, but they haven't really articulated what their foundation is. And once you do that, as we saw last time, I would argue there's points of real incoherence when you put together that particular foundation and that particular superstructure. As last week, uh, I spent a little bit of time going through those, um, what I thought were inconsistencies or incoherencies, or at least at minimum, questions I need answered before that position could hold the moral high ground. So anyway, that's what we did last week. Um, any quick questions or anything about that? Yes, Denise. So, in the last minute, um, my question before you just said what you said is, in what sense is it spiritual? Um, in, in the last... Uh, uh-huh. Well, a number of these people, uh, w w a number of these people would be theistic evolutionists. So, in their view, Darwin is true, and yet God is the creator of, of God is the creator of creation. So, in my view, there's at least a discussion to be had how both those things can be true, uh, because. Clearly, uh, Darwin's account, as it stands, is purely a materialistic account. So the issue is how you would make those two things compatible. In Model A, the model of dominion is absolute ruler, mm -hmm. and I, I forget what that means. And in model B, it's worshiper. So can you just refresh my memory? The, okay. The, the model of dominion, what I'm getting at is kind of how man would articulate his role with regard to creation. So in the first one, he's an absolute ruler. He can do whatever he wants. 
Um, okay, um, other questions? All right, what I would like to do now is I, I wanna start building the model. Um, I wanna start, I'd like to start uh, building a model of environmental ethics. And um, while we're building this as a model for environmental ethics, I would also say that it's, it's kind of the general model, it seems to me, that all of us would use to build our worldview or any part of it. It's the same kind of procedure. We just happen to be doing environmental ethics tonight. Um, so the first place I'd like to start is who is God? And I think I can summarize this quite easily from Genesis 1. Um, and what I want to pull from Genesis 1 here as a point to just articulate that God is a transcendent creator is that we see in each day that the claim is he thinks it and therefore it is. So that's the piece about the creation. In each one of these days, he basically thinks it and it comes to be. Um, so just to begin with, um, I would argue that if we unpack that and then link it with um, the rest of the biblical story, we get a coherent story of a transcendent, of a transcendent creator. Second, who is man? First, man is part of the creation. So man is um, part of the creation just like other animals. Um, but there's a second part of man, he's made in the image of God. The question has always been throughout history, in what sense are we made in the image of God? Um, there's a number of people who've looked at that and they believe that um, the sense in which we ought to be in the image of God is from the perspective of power. Actually, if we look at position one, the Enlightenment, the whole goal of the Enlightenment project is for us, through science, to gain an understanding of nature for the purpose of controlling it to meet our material needs. That that's the purpose of, that, that's the sense in which we are made in the image of God. But at least most of the Christians throughout history have, of course, looked at that and pointed to the moral dimension. And that's interesting because in a way, this is an answer to a question that the others have a problem answering. The question is this, why is man the only animal that is held morally responsible for his actions? The other two views, the pantheistic view or the materialistic view, they really do not have a good answer for that. The materialist, the Darwinist has to say, we differ by degree from animals. That means that in some sense, to make that position coherent, they have to point to some other animal that has some sense of morality. If they can't, then how do we differ by degree? So a key question to raise, how, do, how is it that we differ by degree, um, but yet we are considered unique? We are the only species held accountable for our actions with regard to nature. Everyone seems to agree on that. But the question is, but on what grounds? And I would argue that either from a pantheistic perspective or from a Darwinian perspective, neither one can give a very satisfactory answer to that perspective. The last, what is creation? As I look at Genesis 1, it seems to me that 
what we see in the first uh, six days of creation, we see God basically creating an environment, creating a place for mankind to live. It starts out completely inhospitable. There's no daylight. It's completely dark. And we see that through the creation, step by step, he's stepping and creating an environment, a context for us to live. And as an ecologist, I find this kind of interesting because I think it does say a lot about God. So for instance, okay, if most of the creation is just here for us or here to provide a, a stage or a setting for us, okay, why does he create all these birds in the air? I mean, they primarily aren't for us to eat. Why does he create a lot of fish in the sea that a lot of us rarely ever see? And I mean, not just a few, but thousands of kinds. I mean, God could have created birds, and he could have created fish, and he could have created a couple. But I think it says a lot that he created thousands. And just to make this point, <laughs> I'm a stream ecologist, so I have some real weirdities when it comes to what's out in nature. One of my favorite group of organisms are called caddisflies. There's 1,200 species of them in the US. All of them spin silk. They all make a case, a house. Some of them are made out of stone. Some of them are made out of, out of vegetation. Um, some of them are, are free living, but they make nets to catch their food. But what's interesting about them is every one of the caddisflies, you don't need to see the organism. All you need to do is see the case. Every one of their cases is unique. And in fact, there's a little caddisfly, I've marked the page, I'll pass the book around, that makes sort of a tortoise shell. And there's one species, he makes the tortoise shell out of sand grains. And right here, the, the little sand grain that goes here, it has to be a red sand grain. And if there are no red sand grains in that basin, it will not occur. Um, I mean, just think about all the millions of species that were made and I think that's just a very interesting point to ponder, is he could have made a couple, yeah. uh, but that isn't the way he did it. And I think that's going to be very telling as time goes on. So as far as the creation, um, yes, the creation was to provide for us. It was to provide us with uh, material possessions that we need to live. But it seems to me that there's at least an element that's much broader than that, that's much more important to us. Um, but those, those are the quick remarks I'm going to make on God, man, and creation. I want to go right to Genesis 128 in the issue of subdue. Because what it says is we are to, mankind creates man. We are to increase, fill the earth, multiply, and we are to subdue the creation. And as I mentioned last time, this is a pretty heavy handed word. This word's used uh, the same word, slightly different uh, ending. But the same root word is used in, um, in Ezekiel to talk about the Jews subjugating somebody else. So this is about subjugation. The word is often translated trample or stomp. 
Um, that was one of my fundamental stumbling blocks with Christianity right there. Is my reaction to that is, is that if that's what God is really asking for, if that really is his command, then I hate him. There is nothing admirable here. I don't see that that's a moral response at all. That's the way I read it for at least two to three decades of my life. There came a point at which, uh, for some reason, I don't know all the reasons, but I came back to the Bible to read it with a different set of eyes. And um, subdue. It does mean trample. It does mean stomp. But actually, if you put it in the context of making wine, um, that carries a little bit different set of connotations with it. And it is in the context that's usually used in the sense of treading, treading or trampling to make wine. So that was one place where I began to change my view, possibly, of what was there. The second part of it is I looked at the interaction of God, man, and creation from Genesis 1 to Gen through Genesis 9. And I found that really interesting this time. Genesis 1, God creates all this Mirada stuff all over everywhere and then plants a garden and puts man in it. I mean, he created the whole creation and then actually plants the whole garden. Man doesn't have to do anything. He's given all of it. He's given a perfect setup. All he's got to do is sit here and eat fruit. He does have to take care of it and keep it. So he didn't set it up. He didn't do any of the work. But his job, his job, Adam's job in creation is to keep and maintain the garden. Um, so that seems to me to be an interesting perspective. Now, we'll jump ahead to, uh, let's see, I'll go all the way to Genesis 3. So, um, this is after Adam and Eve have eaten the apple, and they've interacted with God, and God is basically now going to tell them what their relationship with nature is. And again, I think this is highly instructive. This reminds me a little bit of going through the Old Testament and looking at how essentially the promises of God develop over time. I mean, Abraham's given a set of promises. We see the promises with, um, with sons down the road. We see promises to David. We, we see promises, but they kind of develop over time. There's a sense in which I think we see a process here. We see a similar process, only it's not going exactly the same direction for the most part. So what does it say here? Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, uh, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Okay, I'll start with the last piece first. We aren't picking fruit. No more easy pickings fruit. So cursed is the ground. 
So essentially, this is basically saying that the ground isn't going to only produce your food that you can just now pick. It's going to create, it's going to produce a whole raft of species, a lot of which are not only not useful to you, but they compete with the ones you are interested in. And so the last piece of this is you were in the garden and you could walk around and just pick fruit. And now you're going to eat the grain of the field, which means uh, initially it's not clear if you have to plant it and take care of it, but gathering this grain of the field intermixed with all kinds of species, this isn't just picking fruit. This is a lot tougher of a process. So man's relationship here with creation is, is morphing. It's going through some transitions. Another transition. Now we'll get to the flood. So what was the reason for the flood? The reason for the flood was all mankind was evil and only evil thoughts came to mind all the time. There really, mankind had really forgotten and neglected God. So God decides that he's going to save a small remnant but he's going to wipe it, the rest out and he's going to again begin with a new remnant. Well, this new remnant, um, once they come out of the ark, uh, chapter 9 starts. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, that's the same quote as Genesis with one uh, change. It doesn't say, and subdue the earth. Now, what's interesting about this is that is in the matter, or this is the Masoretic text I am reading. But in the Septuagint, the Greek version of it, that verse about subduing the earth is there. So, um, a long discussion I will leave that out of it whether it should be in or not but the point is he's basically giving the same sort of command here but now it continues for fear of you and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of heaven everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish into the sea into your hand they are delivered so basically, now our relationship with creation changes again. We went from eating fruit to eating grain to now we can eat fish and meat. But again, there's an emphasis here that this isn't going to be easy pickings. The creation itself, now the animals fear you you're not just going to go pick fruit. This again is going to be a difficult, um, a difficult living. So just here in Genesis, three snapshots, it seems to me, we see that there's, there's a transformation that's taken place. Why did that transformation take place? Nature was cursed because of man. So nature was put, nature was cursed and it was transformed because of man. And in a sense, to make man's life more, a harder work, to make this more toil, more drudgery, to come up with the sustenance we need to live. So it seems to me that that's a piece of the foundation of what we need to build an environmental ethic. We need this context. 
of God, man, and nature in this interaction and this development over time. That's all I'm going to say about the foundation right now. As I say, we may come back to it with questions, but I want to go on. So later on, we see that God gives the Jews the law. And in the law, there are a number of places where how they are to treat the creation shows up. Um, one of them, Deuteronomy 20, when you besiege a city, you can't cut down fruit trees. You can cut down other kinds of trees to make your, uh, make your weapons and your siege machinery, but you can't cut fruit trees because those are food for people. One of the things now in coming to the law, um, it's always kind of tricky to think about how to think about the law here is, and, and the way I like to think about it is, um, and I have a son here who can vouch for this, and he <laughs> at points in time had a little trouble with this. But I would say something like, don't do X. And he would come back and he'd do eh, X sort of. But it wasn't X. He quickly pointed out it wasn't X. But it seems to me that that's a piece of the dynamics of how we need to look at the law. That when we look at a particular law, we're not just looking at a case that says, okay, when we go to war, we aren't going to cut down fruit trees. But what we are going to look at is kind of what's the principle here? I mean, what other kinds of things fit this kind of principle? And it seems to me that that's how we need to look at all of the laws. That there's a lot of laws written about people and domestic animals that the principles, seems to me, apply to wild animals. Um, I'll make the case for that in just a few minutes as we go. So, but first, if you're going to siege a city, you can't cut down any fruit trees. You can't cut down plants that would be food for people. Um, that's an interesting command, especially interesting given the Western history of warfare. Second, Deuteronomy in 22, it's talking about a bird with young. If you find a bird with young, you can take the young, but not the adult bird. And what's the reason given for this? So that it goes well with you. That there's a moral issue here of how much you can take. And what is your relationship to that particular bird and that particular species? You can take the young, but you can't take the capital that maintains and builds the species. That's off limits. Deuteronomy 24. When you harvest, don't go back and clean the field. If you didn't get it all the first time, leave it. And why? You're leaving it for those less fortunate, neighbors, people in poverty, and sojourners. So one of the interesting pieces here is, um, this is one of those places where it's saying, economic efficiency is not our highest goal. There are a number of things more important than economic efficiency. Leviticus 23, don't reap to the edge of your field. And when you plant fields, leave wide hedgerows. Well, what's that for? 
same sort of thing. You don't harvest the edges and corners of your field. You're supposed to leave roughly 10% for other people to go glean, but also for the wild animals. That those hedgerows and those extra leavings are for them as well. Again, we see that economic efficiency is not the highest goal. I can see an argument being made, but you know, if we really harvested it effectively and more efficiently, if we harvested all, then we could go give it to people. But it seems to me that one of the interesting things about the law is fundamentally what it's about is treating people as if they are important and equal. And that is more important than economic efficiency, it seems to me, is what the law is laying out. Lastly, I want to come to the Sabbath and the Jubilee, which is in Leviticus 25. Uh, here's uh, handouts. So I just, on one side is the list of the things we're talking about. Leviticus 25, the Sabbath and the Jubilee. Well, the Sabbath, I, I want to give just a little bit of background about the Sabbath here for the land is we all know that the seventh day of creation in Genesis 1 was a Sabbath rest. But actually in Leviticus 25, it's laying out that the land is supposed to get a Sabbath as well. That every seven years, every seven years, a field is to lie fallow. Now, in that seven years, now, a couple things about this, about the Sabbath and the Jubilee. Um, first, this pertains to fields. Now, part of the population in, I don't know what portion of the population had fields. I'm assuming probably a lot of them had fields but they're going to be, I am guessing, of various sizes. Secondly, these are not fields that you would be grazing sheep on or grazing animals. It seems to me all the prescriptions we have for fields are about cultivated fields. So this isn't about grazing animals. Grazing animals, it seems to me, I, I may be wrong if somebody knows correct me here, but the little bit I know about it is that at this point in time, the Jews maintained grazing rights is open. It was open. But the fields are private property for each particular family. Each particular family has their own field. Why is that important? Well, one of the issues that it seems to me as an ecologist is if you're trying to manage or think about ethics in the commons, it's pretty tough. Because in common areas, nobody's kind of responsible. No one's responsible if it's overgrazed. No one's responsible if uh, uh, certain people just take their sheep to certain places and just kind of destroy the capacity of the land to produce grass in those areas. There's, there, it's really difficult to talk about a moral or an ethic in those sorts of situations. Closer to home, um, back in the 90s when they were arguing about whether there would be a salmon harvest in the Pacific Ocean at all, Virtually all the troll fishermen that I knew in Florence got up and demanded their right to catch the last fish if it came to it. 
Well, it's in the commons. No one has a responsibility for the management in the commons. If it's commonly held areas, um, it's very difficult to set up a moral and ethical system. I find it interesting that they did not do that here, that they did not set up a moral and ethical system for commons, but only for fields. The fields, as I say, were held um, privately. So what are these regulations with regard to fields? One is the land, as I mentioned, every seven years you are uh, to let it go follow, meaning you don't plant it, um, you don't harvest it, but if stuff comes up, then um, your neighbors or sojourners or the poor, they are free to harvest that material during that seventh year. The Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Jubilee is interesting. The seventh, seventh, 49 years. So the 50th year. In the 50th year, all land goes back to the family that owned it 50 years before. So you could sell land. You could lose it in a card game. You can do all kinds of things with land. But the point is, is that 50 years, it's going back to the family that held it before. And also, any slave in the 50th year is made free. So it seems to me that a couple of the principles with regard to the Sabbath and the Jubilee are in part a reminder that although we are responsible, although they were responsible for a field, a piece of real estate, a piece of property, that property did not belong to them. They essentially were managing it. They were the stewards of the creation. And it seems to me that what we see as we move from Genesis 1, God had put us in a garden. And now we see that because of sin, where we have come with our relationship to the land. So what I would like to do now is present the Christian view of environmental ethics and asking the same questions that we ask of the others. And that's on the flip side of your sheet. The ultimate good for mankind is what Paul and what Paul primarily calls life. Um, I don't know exactly what life is in practice. Um, I only hold a, an idea of it kind of abstractly, but the converse I know real well. Yeah. So death I know pretty well. So just a short, for me, a short little reminder is I think about, and I'm sorry for Gutenberg students here because I, I don't know how to put this in in, in the context, so forgive me for this. But the first thing I'd say is think about the person you were at about 18. Who you were, what the world looked like, and what you were gonna do. And my hunch is, is as life has gone on, you find out you're not quite the person you thought you were, the world isn't quite the place I thought it was. Relationships start out with incredible potential and somehow it gets to be work and they just don't get there. Sort of a snapshot of life or of death. 
life as we experience it here now. So it seems to me that the ultimate goal that God is, has in mind for us is life. But as we've seen with both his solution to this problem, the promises, we saw their evolution. We also see the evolution of our relationship with nature. It's a process. So the purpose of nature here is on one hand to meet our material needs, but that's not an easy process. We need to, in this life, we have to work at it hard. And for many, for many people and at many times, there's a great deal of suffering in that. But in doing that work, that's a major context for us to work out our salvation. That we have to make moral decisions with regard to the creation. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, living in the 21st century, that's a little tough. I mean, when I was growing up on a farm in high school running the family farm, I wanted to buy a guitar and an amp one summer to join this garage band. So I had a choice. I could go cut down a couple of oak trees and sell them, 300-year-old oak trees. I could farm an extra five to 10 acres of hay or wheat. Um, I ended up going to work on a neighbor's farm for three days a week during the summer to make the money. But in that environment, it's kind of easy to see what the costs are, to see what the trade-offs are. But the environment that's been built, this modern environment built by the Enlightenment through industrialization, the specialization which brought us to here, one of the things that it seems to me that's happened is we got separated from that. We got separated from all that, and now it's really, really tough to try to figure out what the trade-offs are. And how do we do this? How do we make moral decisions about stuff? Most of us are really isolated from creation. Most of our lives, I mean, we don't interact with nature directly very much. The majority, overwhelming majority of it is all indirect. So how do we deal with that? How do we make decisions? And I think that's really tough. What I would argue is through technology and science, we created a situation that had never occurred before. One of the problems that it created was just this problem that we don't know how to think about this stuff from a moral perspective very easily. It's pretty tough. But that's part of the system that we built. So what's our immediate goal? Our immediate goal is over time to develop a mature faith. And part of that it's interacting with people. Part of that is interacting with nature. And of course, to meet our material needs. The mechanism for management is righteousness and learning wisdom. That's our mechanism for management. The model of dominion is steward. Man's responsibility is do the right thing. That's pretty easy, sometimes figuring out what exactly the right thing is at points in time, as I've said, that can be pretty tricky. But nonetheless, our responsibility is to try to do the right thing. Does nature have intrinsic worth? Yes. It was created by God. He called it good. And he created this incredible plethora of species of all kinds. Is it necessary to protect all species? I would argue the answer to that is no. 
um, there are higher values. And in places and in points of time, those are decisions that have, have needed to be made and probably will be needed to be made in the future. So again, just to highlight our foundation, God is transcendent. Man was created in the image of God. We were put here on the stage to basically, and our primary task here is to manage the creation. In Genesis 1, that was the goal that was given to Adam. And I don't see that that ever changed. The dynamics of how it's worked out changed. But man throughout the Old Testament, all the way through Genesis to the law, because the rest of creation, there isn't any moral agents here. They only do what they're intrinsically built to do. Man is the only being in the creation who can actually manage. Because in order to manage, you got to have moral judge. You have to make moral judgments. Yeah. You have to be rational. There's a whole series of traits that have to go along with that. And so it seems to me that from the beginning, that a major piece of our lives was to be structured around our responsibility to maintain this stage that we've been put on. That we are the only beings here to actively manage it within the creation. Okay, I said I would try to finish in the first hour. I kind of made it, but I recognize that that's an incredible sketchy snapshot all the way through. But I wanted to leave time to, let's talk about pieces of it, pieces you agree, disagree, or parts you want to talk about. Um, we've got uh, half an hour or so. <coughs> so help me. I've been working on this for a while, but I have a ways to go yet, I'm sure. important qualities. I mean, I think I appreciate what you said about this moral judgment that's re required to be good stewards is really righteousness and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's true. So that's troubling. Why is that troubling? There's not a lot of it around. <laughs> Well, or not a lot of people commit really committed to it. Yeah. I mean, given what you've said about uh, the three different uh, secular views, there isn't any of that there. That's for the most part correct. In the, in the middle view, there is some of it. It's grounded a little different. But there is, I, I would say, just common sense wisdom that is in the second, in the middle category. But the two extreme positions, no. Um, there is not wisdom and righteousness. One comment, I'll just make it now because I assume sooner or later it's going to come. But um, the question gets asked sooner or later, especially by enviros, the radical enviros that after I talk a little bit about what it looks like to restore salmon and stuff. Their position is, well, this is the most pessimistic story I've ever heard. Um, this is not a progress. This is not an optimistic picture of the future. It's not. But it seems to me the environment is no different from any other thing we have to deal with in Christianity, like our relationships with each other. I mean, if we could really do it right now, 
then the gospel is a lie. That's the punchline here. If we could really manage nature rightly with wisdom and righteousness, then the gospel is a lie. Because if we could really do it, then we don't need to get saved from anything. That sin is dominating our management of the natural world, just like it's dominating our relationships with other people. They're part and parcel, part of the same total view. And I think that's why in Romans 8, Paul talks about in nature self-groaning for salvation. Because it's part of it too. All of this is a part of one piece. We've not been very good at recognizing this is just another piece of the same problem. It's, an, it's the identical same problem. Does that make sense? Do you follow? Yes. I, I think I largely agree with you on all the points <coughs> that you just made. I just have a like, comment that I question that I would like you to comment on. Okay. Which is, it seems like in the law, however, and I think carrying through into the New Testament, there's this idea of here's what you ought to do. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a sense of this is too hard for you. Because mm -hmm. I mean, Moses even says, this right. isn't too hard for you. Right. In the sense that here's what you need to know to do what, to be the kind of people that God wants you to be. Mm -hmm. The problem is I think everything that you just described, which is fundamentally we don't, in our natural kind of state, we don't really, aren't really interested in being people on God's terms. We want to be people on our terms. Right. And, and that leads to all of the very depressing picture that you're painting. Mm -hmm. And I do think that ultimately God's going to have to put an end to the rebelliousness mm -hmm. and, and fully redeem it. It does seem to me though, that there's a sense in which, and I think some hopefulness and maybe not optimism, but a hope can come in. And I think you would agree with this, but this is what I want you to comment on, okay. which is I, we can understand what the creator wants. Mm -hmm. And if we want what the creator wants with his help, we can do what the creator wants. And to that extent, begin to make small, pro, not necessarily progress, but like we can begin mm -hmm. to heal the world. Yes. And that there's that, that is actually we can begin to fulfill the telos that we were made for. I, I think we can make progress along those lines. Yes. Yeah, I'd agree. And that that in our world today can be very revolutionary. I mean, mm -hmm. it can look really different from what, every, what a lot of other people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that God honors that? Like, do, do you have a sense for that, that? I don't know. I, I I don't know that I could answer that question. I don't. I don't think I can answer it. I guess what's underlined that is the sense of God made the world, and saw that it was good, mm -hmm. and and made it something that can thrive. Mm -hmm. And our job is just not to mess it up. Mm -hmm. And we mess it up. Yeah. So if we stop messing it up, it can go back to thriving. Uh quite quickly. I mean, I've, I've seen that just in mm -hmm. trying to manage our own backyard. Like mm -hmm. we can do a lot of help to amend the soil mm -hmm. just in a few years of just doing some really common sense things. And so I guess that's what I was underlying. Like God's kind of built into the world uh, in his world on his terms, not on, not in the way humans run the world, mm -hmm. but on his terms in the creation, it, it's meant to thrive. And it can do that as long, maybe the reason it's groaning is because we come along and try to convert it into something that it's not. What do you think about that? Well, that's tricky. Yeah. Um, a tricky part of that is, is what are you going to say about the part in Genesis 3 of it was a garden and now there's all these thorns and thistles, all these other species that are growing and competing and getting in the way of the stuff we want. 
So, and it seems to me that, um, and then there's the additional step of all the birds and animals in after the flood, that was a big change too. So it seems like there's been a prog there's been a, a very major shift from the garden to uh, to after the flood. Before the flood, I mean, I, I think that's what Adam was doing in the garden. I mean, God planted the whole garden. He didn't have to do it. It was all there. All he had to do was take care of it. And it looks like he didn't have all the problem of weeds and thistles and stuff. Sounded like that's actually a pretty easy deal to keep it and take care of it. So, but as I say, after the additional steps, this gets trickier and trickier. I agree with you that we can do small things that are very important on areas that we control, that we, that we have been given the responsibility of, of taking care of. We can make choices. So yes, we can make choices on what we've been given to make choices on. So some people have been given lots of opportunity to do this, other people less opportunities. But it seems to me that there's a whole host of questions, not just direct, but indirect issues as well here. Um, maybe I'll, right now I'll comment on those. Um, for anybody who was here when I did my little session on uh, on global warming last spring, one of the things I pointed out is um, is my position on it is our temperatures higher now than they have been in the recent past. Yes, as our burning of fossil fuel caused part of that. Yes. Do I have a percent? No. Somewhere between 15 and 80? I have no idea. But what I want to say is, it's easy to understand how we got in this perspective. Anyone who remembers was here. I like to use um, Lewis Mumford's five stages of technology. We start out in the first stage as Egyptians using human beings as labor and we build the pyramids. Then you move to the Greeks and Romans, you've now got an oxen power as opposed to a human power. Then you get the third stage, which is water mills and windmills through about the 1600s. And then now comes the industrial revolution. So the first three, there's no creation of fossil fuels really there. I mean, it's, it's there, but it's real minimal. But now we start with steam. And now we start with coal. The locomotive is, say, 100 horsepower to start with. But what have they become? But now in the 1960s, what's the, what's the fundamental unit of power? a 75,000 horsepower electric turbine. There's the cause of global warming, if there is a human cause of it. There it is. I mean, it's that simple. So, okay, but what do we do with that? Those are the real tricky questions. I'd be the first to admit, I don't have any idea. This is a problem that never would have come up had we not gone down this road. But we went down the road. We're here. We aren't going back. So these become really tricky, really difficult questions, it seems to me. And I'm open to hear a lot of wisdom about those kinds of problems. I don't have those answers, but it strikes me that that's the context of at least the questions we need to be asking. Anyway, 
Go, Paul. I've got two. I think okay. the, the first one I hope is easy. And then I'll, the second one I think is a little more difficult. The first one is you said it's not necessary to protect all the species. Mm -hmm. Is that because the flood presumably wiped out some species? Well, the flood presumably wiped out a whole lot of species. Right. And, and that um, would be why species aren't no, um, protected? My thinking would go like this. Um, well, where are we? Uh, yeah, let me do this. Let, let, me, let me read an answer. I came sort of prepared for a question pretty close to this. Um, written by Aldo Leopold. Oh, for people that he he came he lived in Wisconsin the ecologist uh, he's one of the leading ecologists of the 20th century and when I talked about a group of folks in Michigan that went to rebuild he was doing the same thing in Wisconsin um, this is on the monument to a pigeon okay. and this is about a passenger pigeon now in 1860 on his property in Wisconsin in a 50 mile range, there were estimated to be 180 million pigeons in a 50 mile radius of his place. Uh, a monument to the pigeon is they're extinct now. Um, I, I think this bears uh, thinking about it. We have erected a monument to commemorate the funeral of a species. It symbolizes our sorrow. We grieve because no living man will see again the, onrun the onrushing phalanx of victorious birds, sweeping a path for spring across the March skies, chasing the defeated winter from all the woods and prairies of Wisconsin. Men still live who in their youth remember pigeons. Trees still live, who in their youth were shaken by a living wind, but a decade hence, only the oldest oaks will remember, and at long last, only the hills will know. There will always be pigeons in books and museums, but these are effigies and images, dead to all hardships and to all delights. Book pigeons can't dive out of a cloud to make deer run for cover or to clap their wings and thunderous applause at mass-laden woods. Book pigeons camp breakfast on new mowed weed in Minnesota and dine on blueberries in Canada. They know no urge of seasons. They feel no kiss of the sun, no lash of wind and weather. They live forever by not living at all. Our grandfathers were less well-fed, less well-housed, and less well-clothed than we are. The strivings by which they bettered their lot are also those which deprived us of pigeons. Perhaps we now grieve because we're not sure in our hearts that we've gained by the exchange. The gadgets of industry bring us more comforts than pigeons did, but do they add as much to the glory of spring? These things I say should have come to us. I fear that they have not come to many. For one species to mourn the death of another is a new thing under the sun. The crow magnum who slew the last mammoth thought only of stakes. The sportsman who shot the last pigeon thought only of his prowess. The sailor who clubbed the last auk thought of nothing at all. But we who've lost our pigeons mourn the loss. Had the funeral been ours, the pigeons would have hardly mourned us. In fact, rather than Mr. DuPont's nylons or Mr. Vanderveer's bush, Mr. Vanderveer Bush's bombs lie the objective evidence of our superiority over the beast. This monument, perched like a duck hawk on this cliff, will scan this wide valley, watching through days and years. For many a march, it will watch the geese go by, telling the river about cleaner, colder, lonelier waters on the tundra. For many an April, it will see the red buds come and go. For many a May, the, fresh, the flush of oak blossoms on a thousand hills. Uh, I'm gonna skip down. We are told by economic moralists that to mourn the pigeon is mere nostalgia. 
And if the pigeoners had not done away with him, the farmers would ultimately have been obliged to in self-defense to do so. This is one of those peculiar truths that are valid, but not for the reasons alleged. The pigeon was a biological storm. He was the lightning that played between two opposing potentials of intolerable intensity, the fat of the land and the oxygen of the air. Yearly, the feathered tempest roared up and down and across the continent, sucking up the laden fruits of forests and prairies, burning them in a traveling blast of life. Like other chain reactions, the pigeon could not survive his own furious intensity. When pigeoners subtracted from his numbers, the pioneers cut gaps in the continuity of his fuel. His flame gutted out with hardly a sputter or even a wisp of smoke. Today, the oaks still flaunt their burden at the sky, but the feathered lightning is no more. Worm and weevil must now perform slowly and silently the biological task that once drew thunder from the firmament. The wonder is not that pigeons went out, but that he ever survived all the millennia of time before ours. Anyway, I'll stop, but the point is, is pigeons, like any other species, as soon as you cut down the forests and did ag, they're gone. And there's whole hosts of species that all have those similar sorts of needs that they're almost impossible to maintain when human beings um, settle and develop land as we have developed it through history. Okay. Not to say that there aren't other ways we could do it in a way that would maintain those, but any way that we would essentially not have a clear plan for the east half of the United States, you couldn't maintain pigeons. Okay. Does that answer your question? So I, I, I think from that we, you, you're saying the the fact that man needed to clear land in order to grow crops to feed himself is possibly more important than making sure that we have uh, pigeons. Yes, at a point that is true. Okay. Now, if we aren't at that point, then there are decisions to right. Mm -hmm. But in certain places on the globe, it is a question of life and death. Yeah. And, and yeah. man is more important than pigeon. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. And that's the point exactly at where the bee environmentalists say that's where human beings have become the parasite. They need to go. Mm. Right. Okay, we won't go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, my next question had more to do with um, man's role and mm -hmm. of being a steward, mm -hmm. and and what Karina was saying that the it was kind of pessimistic with no hope, and could we could man ever heal the world? Mm -hmm. heal creation mm -hmm. what you were saying from genesis it made it sound like our trajectory is that it's supposed to get harder and harder well it got harder. it got harder and harder yes and as i think of entropy i'm wondering if our role is not to heal the world but to slow down its decay as yeah. much as we can well, I, yeah, I, I would, instead of decay, I would say trajectory. To slow down its trajectory. Okay. Yeah, is, I, I mean, like I say, I think, I think creation is no different than any other part of life that a Christian has to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, without 
essentially without grace, without a desire, and without a change of heart, one is not going to begin to do oh, the kind of things to it turn it around be, at all. It would take a, a revolution of right. every human being right. to become righteous and wise right. for us to slow it down enough. Right. But, but having said that, though, each of us have our own little piece. Where we couldn't make a difference. That's I right. get that. Yeah. And it, part of me wonders, does the fact that it's God who's going to create a new heaven and new earth mm -hmm. and not man that, that would inform that, that view, um, that it's only God who can fix it or heal it? Right. Well, I, I think that's, well, man's sin nature is the problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Came armed, ready. Well, no. <laughs> I, I have a million thoughts, and I'm probably going to take us far afield from your primary points, and I don't necessarily want to do that. Where do I start? I'm not sure that it would require that humanity become righteous in order to start doing the right thing with regard to the environment. I think all it would require, and this is equally unlikely, is that we start to educate ourselves about the implications of our actions on the environment for our own practical purposes. And could you give me an example of what that might look like? Boy, there are a million examples. Um, well, the, the range is all the way from global warming, mm -hmm. which we may or may not, as a, as a society or a worldwide um, you know, group of people, be able to recognize and do anything about, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, spraying uh, glyphosate on our gardens, mm -hmm. I mean, and killing worms. Right. I mean, so the, the range is, is across the entire spectrum of the way in which each of us can and does impact the world in which we live mm -hmm. and the food that we eat and the air that we breathe mm -hmm. and the water that we drink. And I mean, you know, there are uh, irreligious practical bases for learning about and doing the right thing with regard to this environment in which we all live. Mm -hmm. So like I said, that's not well, environmental that's ethics, part, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. It's more practical. Well, but it is. I mean, it, it's rooted in that. And, and I agree. Um, we, can, we could and we should continue to think about those things and implement those sorts of things. My perspective is, though, that yes, we can make some progress. But ultimately, my worry is I don't think the ultimate problem is that we don't know what we need to do. I think, by and large, we have enough of an idea of, of what we ought to do. We, we just aren't made out of the stuff that's going to make the decisions to make that happen. My, my impression of our society in this country is that we are clueless about what it means to be environmentally responsible. Um, certainly, tr I, I couldn't tell you how much of the population, but sure, that's true. But there are certain subcultures that know quite a lot, and even in the subcultures that know quite a lot, um, it seems to me, though, that you can make a certain amount of progress, but in the end, the only thing that would really solve this problem is a moral fix. Because... If the decision comes down to my material lifestyle or X, what are we going to pick? The problem with that is we, 
I don't know what you exactly mean by material lifestyle, but if we understood the trade-off that m most of us make when we when we trade environmental responsibility for immediate short-term gain in whatever area, mm -hmm. we have been foolish. Sure. And if we understood that trade-off, we would <laughs> we would make different decisions. Yeah. No, I, I to to a certain extent I agree, but see what I would want to say. I I think we have an analogy here with our personal relationships with each other, and that yes, there is a point and a place for education, is all of that, but they aren't getting fixed short of a moral fix, and my perspective is. I think the creation is in the same place. I think they're part and parcel. And that's what I think is in Genesis, that that's how tightly this whole thing is tied together, is that that's just one more arena for our morality to show itself. But I do agree with you, with some education, we can make progress. I'm with you there. <laughs> Well, we know that we're commanded to love one another, and yet we still hurt each other. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. That's your point. Yeah. Yeah, that is the point. And as I say, if we could truly fix it, then it seems to me that gospel is a lie. Yes. So that that is a truth. It's part of this. Anyway, I think we've run out of time, but I'll hang around if somebody wants to Thank hang you very around. much. Okay. That was excellent. <laughs>